anyway, um, so today we'll just move in with the uh, first object of uh, the Magisterium, basically dogma. So that's easy, this part is easy. Uh, dogmatic progress, that's where we left yesterday, uh, page 42, the dogmatic progress, I mean yesterday or the day before. Uh, the theologian Benvel, so I'm using Benvel here because he gives those principles uh, which are very clear, so it makes it evident, so that's why I'm quoting him. We have a reprint of his book here, which I brought, so we can find that here. Uh, but he gives four principles for the uh, development of dogma, and uh, those are very good, so we can just follow that. First principle, the whole Catholic revelation was always, at least implicitly, contained in the faith of the Church. So the Catholic Church has the deposit of revelation, which is contained in sacred scripture and tradition, as you know, and always has to preserve the faith in the deposit of revelation. But sometimes, as I mentioned last time, sometimes it can, it can be done implicitly. So, for example, you will not find, I told you, you will not find the expression immaculate conception in the works of the early fathers, but you will find things in equivalent terms. So, uh, that Our Lady was the new Eve, that she was never... Uh, under the, uh, the uh, she was never submitted or, or uh, enslaved to the devil and so forth and so on. So you would have the, the faith in equivalent terms and implicitly sometimes. Uh, so that's important. And it, it is true with regard to the past, but it's also true in regard to the future in the sense that the, f the church cannot lose that. So this requires negatively that the preaching and the sense of a church be never contrary to revelation, obviously. Uh, so it's impossible that in the whole church, for example, uh, be believed something that actually is contrary to sacred scripture. Positively, that there be sometimes a profession of it, at least implicitly, orally, or by a sign. So never, obviously, a truth of faith should never be denied in the church, and also at least implicitly, at least once in a while, you will see signs that it is always in the deposit of faith, as I told you for the Immaculate Conception. Consequently, the Church cannot discover new truths. There are no new revelations, right? The, the common revelation, the public revelation, again, has ended at the death of St. John. That's it. No more dogmas, mysteries to be revealed. The church can never forget a revealed truth nor lose the true sense of it. Notice that, that's important. She cannot lose the sense of it. So, for example, transubstantiation was defined by the Council of Trent. And you cannot have a, a new council now saying, well, you know what, actually, it didn't really mean that. And, you know, the Council of Trent was being Thomist, but now we follow another philosophy, blah, 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 as a lot of modernists do. On the contrary, the modernists and the theologians of the Nouvelle Theologie uh, pretended to return to the source to find the true sense of the Gospel, which was a pretext to depart from the Catholic doctrine. Uh, has anyone of you taken the class on the Nouvelle Theologie? No? As far as Desposito, he does that. Yeah. So I, w I hope for you that you get it because it's very interesting to what it is basically is going through all the writings of um, Araner and and uh, Congar and all of those people basically to see what each one of them says, and um, so you can see how it's not pure modernism as it was with Loisy and the people who were condemned in the time of Saint Pius X, but it was it's a little bit like a, a semi-modernism in the sense that they you know they they got rid of what was too obvious and it was it became more subtle and the nouvelle theology is basically vatican II. vatican II canonized you might say the nouvelle theology so it's very important to to um to study those things so i hope you had the cl that class at some point um Benvel connects these first principles with the indefectibility of a church uh, so he says here, it was always the sentiment of the fathers, of theologians, of the whole church, that nothing of which has been confided to the church has been lost. The church is infallible in keeping the deposit of revelation, so that cannot be lost. That the church never denies what she previously believed, and that the faith of the fathers is the same as that of the sons, and this is part uh, of uh, her indefectibility. Okay, notice that the church never denies what she previously believed. 
it seems obvious, but it's always nice when it's actually said. So the church cannot change dogma or say, well, you know, religious liberty was bad, but now uh, we're okay. Second principle, it exists, however, uh, a real progress, so there exists probably, that would be better. There exists, however, a real progress, with two S's, not only in the subjective faith of the faithful, but also in the proposition and objective explanation of revelation by the church. So it is evident that the subjective faith of the faithful progresses in the sense of a better comprehension of a dogma in the individual Catholic. And this is definitely your case, at least hopefully it is, <laughs> right now, uh, by being trained in the, at the seminary. You deepen your faith. It's not that you uh, have, you know, I don't know. It's not, I mean, you already had the faith, hopefully, when you enter the seminary, but you know more things. You know more things. Uh, you uh, Maybe the mysteries, for example, of the rosaries, you knew them already, but you, you deepen them. But also, uh, there, may, there may be things that are actually defined by the church that you were ignorant of, and over time, you learn about them. So, so that, that is subjective in the sense is what it is for the, the subject, for each one of you. Uh, but this is true also for uh, for the church. Theology, like all other science, can be acquired or lost. Concerning the progress in the proposition of dogma, history shows that new definitions took place through time. The Immaculate Conception, for example. Thus, what was believed previously implicitly becomes explicit. And in some cases, what has been disputed, even by the doctors of a church, is explicitly proposed by the church uh, so that one can neither deny nor doubt this truth without falling into heresy now. So it can be defined at some point, even though in the history it might have been the uh, occasion of a uh, certain discussion and dispute. Let's see. So Fafliss is the one who detained Nico. So I guess he will come. Uh, look at the uh, the footnote. I obviously put the uh, very famous example of... Um, oh, no, I didn't. <laughs> uh, well, the Immaculate Conception, you know that. But I said... Okay, come in. Do you have your paper that I uh, had put in there? Okay. So we are page 43. Uh, so the footnote 78 says, An example of a truth which was professed more and more explicitly over time is the universal mediation of Our Lady, According to many eminent theologians, this doctrine is part of revelation and could one day be the object of a solemn dogmatic definition. Some action seems to have been taken with that intention under Pope Pius XII. This is now on hold, sadly, but let us, I put let us pray that to one day witness the dogmatic definition of Our Lady's universal mediation. If this happens, I will die of joy. But uh, <laughs> imagine having a Pope defining the dogma. From where we come today, it would be it would just be um, we would have heart attacks. Mm. We'd have to go slowly because otherwise it would be too much too much joy at at one point. The body cannot take it. But uh, under Pope Pius XII, well, it's true that uh, under Pope Pius XII there was a development, obviously, of the Mariology. A lot, a lot of uh, Mariology was going on. Uh, the uh, it is said that the uh, the feast that he introduced of the queenship of Our Lady was meant to be a step, actually, a step towards the definition of uh, her mediation and uh, co-redemption. Because in that document, at Celi Reginam of uh, 54, he, uh, he actually bases the uh, queenship of Our Lady on those two truths. So, I mean, he's already teaching them, basically. He did not define them yet, but he was already teaching them and instituting the, the feast of the queenship of Our Lady based on that. So, it... I mean, very clearly, th there was a, a move towards that, but uh, yeah, somebody came and uh, was not too happy with it. Meaning Roncalli, he, when Pope Isaac XII defined the assumption of Our Lady, Roncalli was like, ah, why? It's not good for the ecumenism, and also he wasn't too happy with it. So he's like, he did not deny the assumption, obviously, he, he, he was smarter than that, but he was like, why would you do that? You know, it's going to make it harder for the heretics. <laughs> I mean, he didn't say heretics, but that's me. <laughs> <laughs> so in any case, it was uh, all stopped at Vatican II. I, I think I already told you that uh, you had a number of, of uh, theologians who actually wanted 
the mediation of Our Lady to be defined uh, at Vatican II. And obviously, that was rejected for the sake of ecumenism. So. But in a way, it's, it's, uh, it's, I take it as a consoling thing. I mean, there is a consoling aspect into it, which is that the, uh, you might say the mediation of the church was denied or rejected at the same time as the mediation of Our Lady was, in the sense that uh, with the uh, idea of the Holy Ghost using other churches, blah, 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 the idea is basically you can be saved outside of a Catholic church uh, by other religions. That's the idea of Vatican II. Uh, and the same way they rejected the mediation for lady, you know, meaning well, you know, you can be saved without our lady, basically. So, in a way, it, it uh, they were rejected at the same time for the same reason, ecumenism. So, in a way, it, it gives us some hope because um, there is uh, the saying in the liturgy that our lady crushes all heresies. So, eventually, she's going to crush it too. And Spain will have a beautiful feast for our lady mediation, right? <laughs> so, in any in any case, um, it gives us some. Um, some hope. Also, the same thing happens with the papacy and the uh, collegiality. So it's always the same. You see, normally uh, the power of the church always comes through the, the pope, and they deny that. Or uh, any salvation comes through the church, deny that. Or uh, graces come through a lady, deny that, at least implicitly in rejecting it. So all, it's always the same. You see, it, it's a pattern that that uh, you can see throughout Vatican II. So our lady will take care of that eventually. Concerning this progress in the proposition of, of dogma, uh, Pope Pius XI teaches in Mortalium Animus, this is uh, one of the, the most beautiful encyclical because it's so good. Uh, he says, for the teaching authority of the church which in the divine wisdom was constituted on earth in order that revealed doctrines might, uh, might remain intact forever and that uh, they might be brought with ease and security to the knowledge of men, so think about the Novus Ordo, it doesn't work, <laughs> and which is daily exercised through the Roman pontiff and the bishops who are in communion with him. Uh, I'm sure you know Bergoglio said that he was in communion with apostates and heretics right now, uh, just yesterday. So in any case, uh, has also the office of defining when it sees fit any truth with solemn rites and decrees whenever this is necessary either to oppose the errors of the, the, or the attacks of heretics or more clearly and in greater detail to stamp the minds of the faithful with the articles of sacred doctrine which have been explained. So sometimes again, s uh, truth will already be proposed but he just wants to make it, as he says here, to stamp, to stamp it in the mind of the faithful more clearly in greater detail. So. Uh, that was the case with the assumption, in the sense that Pope Isaac XII actually did, uh, we would say today, Paul, in the sense that he asked all the bishops what they thought about defining the dogma of the assumption, and basically all the bishops were like, well, yeah, I already believe that already. So uh, Pope Isaac XII said, well, it's already part of the universal ordinary magisterium, so obviously I can make a dogma out of it. It's already part of the faith anyway, you see? So it was already believed by the whole church, he made it, he made it to the supreme level of proposition, which is a dogma of faith, solemnly defined, but it was already taught. Let's go back to Pope Pius XI. But in the use of this extraordinary teaching authority, no newly invented matter is brought in, nor is anything new added to the number of those truths which are at least implicitly contained in the deposit of revelation, divinely handed down to the church. Only those which are made clear uh, which perhaps may st still seem obscure to some, or that which some have previously called into question is declared to be of faith. I think I would have to rework that last phrase a little bit. Uh, so the church obviously is there to define when things are contested or obscure or whatever, or when there is a need for that. Third principle. It is therefore possible that there be in the church a controversy concerning a dogma which was not yet explicitly proposed. And you know the very famous example about the Immaculate Conception in the Middle Ages. Even great theologians and holy doctors of the church were wrong about this question because of its difficulties. So Saint Bernard, for example, Saint Bernard actually denied the Immaculate Conception, uh, I mean, it's not that he denied it knowing it was of faith, obviously, but he thought that doesn't make sense theologically. So he was against uh, against that, actually. 
for Saint Thomas Aquinas, uh, I won't get into that because <laughs> even Dominicans don't agree. So uh, I won't get into that. Merkelbach says yes, he did deny it, uh, but uh, Garrigou is more like yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> so uh, I won't get into that. If if Dominicans don't know, I w I won't know. I mean, basically, he said certain things that would make you think that he did uh, he w did um, deny the Immaculate Conception at some point in his life, uh, but then he affirmed it. So it's not too sure exactly what he meant, and I won't get into that. Uh, okay, certainly, certainly they, th they have not lost the virtue of faith. I imagine Saint Bernard, <laughs> obviously. Uh, but they thought that it was not a revealed truth. The difficulties were then resolved by the proclamation of a dogma by Pope Pius IX. And uh, Scotus is known famously to have brought a uh, solution, basically, to the difficulty that St. Thomas Aquinas saw. So we have to grant to everybody his you know, credit to whom credit is due. So. I'm thinking about the broken clock, but uh, I shouldn't know. I won't say anything. <laughs> it happened uh, often that the revealed truth was first believed implicitly. Uh, so take the Immaculate Conception. Believed implicitly as because Our Lady is the new Eve. Then it became an object of controversy because of object objection. So you try to make it very precise. After the solution of the difficulties, it is proposed and believed explicitly. And in a way, that happens actually even in... Uh, in theology, not necessarily for things that are of faith, but in the sense that when you are researching something, sometimes you will see another argument or an objection against it, and then you will be like, oh, okay. And then you research it more, and then it becomes actually more clear and evident. So it's a, it's a normal, it's a natural process that things happen that way. Uh, Benvel remarks that a false opinion, notice that, can never spread to such an extent that it becomes the opinion of a church. Here re, we return to the first principle. The whole revelation was always contained, at least implicitly, in the faith of a church. So that, uh, that should be taken um, in relation to what we have said before about the simply authentic magisterium, which we said was not positively infallible in the sense that the Pope was not defining the faith. Yet you see it is impossible that in the official doctrine of a church something wrong or uh, definitely something that would be against the faith uh, creeps in. So keep that in mind. Fourth principle. It is impossible that there be in the universal church a false comprehension of dogma or some opinion positively contrary to a dogma or that there be a corruption or a darkening of the revealed truth as pretended by uh, Protestants and Jansenists. So those things have been actually condemned by the Densinger. Because the, the Protestants were like, well, the faith is basically darkened in the entire world and this and that, and those, that was condemned. So. Uh, Benvel precises, uh, the revelation would have been corrupted if the church taught something wrong, notice that, either through the denial of something revealed, either through the transmission of something that has not been revealed, either through a false comprehension or explanation of something revealed, it would be darkened if one of the preceding cases were to happen or if revealed truth ceased to be preached, notice that, or to be well known, and if a profession were neglected, so transubstantiation, for example, it's like, oh, well, well you know, Bergoglio perhaps is not saying that Actually, I don't know if he denied that. <laughs> he might have because he denied so many things. But uh, in the Novus Ordo, uh, you know, maybe they won't deny, at least for most of them, they won't deny upfront transubstantiation, but they will basically not teach it, which is the same in the sense that it, it's still against indefectibility. And I know because uh, when I was young, I, I had some catechism in Novus Ordo. I know exactly that it's not taught and it's not in the catechisms even. It's just not taught. So I guess it might depend di from different countries. I don't know in how it is in Poland, for example. It might be a little more conservative in that regard. But in France, I can tell you for sure, because I've been there, it's not taught. People don't know about it. It's only when they became conservative that all of a sudden they realized, wait a minute, Christ is in the Blessed Eucharist? <laughs> and they are surprised. They never heard it before. Which seems, I mean, this is so central to the faith. Like it, how can you miss that? Like, I mean, obviously, right? So it, 
the only solution, the only answer is <laughs> this is not from the spirit of truth, obviously. So, uh, okay, the church, uh, here is a quote from, uh, I forgot which, actually, <laughs> I forgot where I took it, but we'll see that it's from one of the um, uh, documents of the church. Uh, I think it's from Pope Pius XI, Mortal Humanimus. The church has done nothing with greater zeal than she has displayed in guarding the integrity of the faith. So again, we should think about the church as something li alive, living, in a sense that when somebody is, li is alive, you if you poke him with a pin, right, there is a reaction, right? So if, if one of the points of the faith is denied, the church answers back. That's normal, that's life, right? If you insult somebody, he will answer back. But uh, at least if you poke him with a pin, he will, he will react, right? So the church acts that way as well. It's impossible to think that the church could just, you know, let doctrine be destroyed and, and not say anything. So it pertains hence to the magisterium, which is the rule of faith to faithfully preserve the deposit of the revealed troops. Um, this is her very function. This is the mission that the church has received from our Lord, who gave her, therefore, his authority and who has promised to her his special assistance. This mission of protecting the deposit includes necessarily the duty of condemning the contrary errors. The Holy Ghost, whenever it is opportune, excites the pastors of a church to defend the truth of the gospel. This aversion to for error, or to error, I suppose, I don't know, necessarily flows from the mission of a church and distinguishes her from false religions. So the church cannot remain passive. It will answer back. And it always did. Uh, look at the footnote here. As we have already repeated and insisted upon, the church's magisterium could not so much as remain silent when faced with the spreading of error. And here I give you a quote by Du Blanchy. Du Blanchy, he's, he's not like a big theologian like B.O. or whatever, but he wrote a number of, of uh, articles uh, on ecclesiology. So he's a learned theologian. Uh, he wrote particularly in the DTC a number of articles uh, concerning the, uh, you see here, the article church, église, but also infallibility of the Pope and whatever, the other things. So he's well known in that, in that uh, field, let's say. So anyway, he, uh, he's a little bit like, a, I would compare him to like a, a French version of Monsignor Fenton in a sense, as far as importance. Anyway, he says, the universal ordinary magisterium is lastly exercised in a tacit manner by the tacit approval given by the church to the teaching of the fathers, doctors, and theologians when she lets it spread it to the universal church to effectively guide the beliefs and the practical life of the faithful. For the church would not be fulfilling her mission to integrally keep the deposit of revelation if she could, by remaining silent, allow a universal teaching which would not be in accordance with revelation and would actually tend to weaken it. And that would be the same for uh, a rite of the mass or things like that. So the manifestation of the indefectibility of a church today is precisely that people actually reacted to it, even though it's a small portion. But there was a reaction, and we are still there today, fighting against the new mass, against Vatican II and all of this, and it's not going to, uh, to, to win, basically. I mean, Vatican II eventually will disappear. That's how the, the, um, the presence of the Holy Ghost is manifested. So uh, that's a very important point, that by just letting things spread, the church is al already um, approving that, in a way, tacitly. And this is actually how the, uh, the tra translation of St. Jerome was recognized as authentic by the Council of Trent. The Council of Trent said, you know, this translation of St. Jerome is being used everywhere. It can't be wrong. That's the argument they made. That was it. And it's a true argument. Obviously, they knew what they did, but it's a true argument. And it obviously should apply to a lot of things today. Nico? Yes, but no, in the sense that you can have a lot of people falling into error, but what it matters is that in the official doctrine of a church, it, it won't, it, that you don't have that. So you can have a lot of bishops, they will be authentic pastors. You can have a, lot, a number of bishops that actually would be corrupted, but it's impossible that the universal teaching church be teaching error. 
You see? Well, again, you have both sides, right? You have active infallibility, passive infallibility. So uh, it definitely, the active on the active side, the teaching church definitely it can't be the official doctrine of a church that you know basically loses that. But then on the on the part of the learning church, that indefectibility of faith doesn't work the same way. In the sense that you could have even uh, you know a great number of them falling away from the Catholic faith, but it's impossible that the whole church loses the faith, basically. In the sense, yeah, it's a, it's a sign of a presence of the Holy Ghost that there, there has been a reaction and that not everybody fell into the trap, basically. Yeah. So the only way the only way you can reconcile that with what is happening is precisely by saying, well, you know, this is not the official doctrine of the church, they don't have authority. Because if you say they have authority, then it's a big problem, obviously. Yeah? What do you mean? Yeah, but it's not impossible in the sense uh, we're getting more into like the physics things. But uh, well, in the sense that, for example, whenever a pope dies, de facto you don't have uh, infallible teaching church. You still have maybe bishops in this and that diocese. But let's say you live in Rome, for example, you don't have anybody to teach you, or if you are in diocese where the bishop is also dead, you don't have anybody to teach you, and it doesn't really help you that there is a bishop someplace. You know what I mean? Because he's not your authority anyway. So really what matters is that the apostolicity of the Roman See be preserved. Because the supreme magisterium de facto disappears every time the Pope dies. But the church remains, uh, retains the, the, the potency to recover it. That has to stay, however. And that's very important. It's actually part of her indefectibility, according to Franz Elena, which makes sense. Uh, Eden? Yes, it does, yeah, for sure, yeah, absolutely. It's a very um, uh, fragile situation, we might say, in this, and that's why the church always, you know, makes sure that somebody is elected as soon as possible. Yeah. So it's a very, very, uh, our crisis is, is very uh, sad in that regard because we're in a situation where we're kind of stuck, like, uh, precisely in, in that, that we, we do not have an authority, at the same time, the church normally would try to get somebody to do that, but then, then we have the problem of somebody who is not doing his job. So, yes, it's uh, we have to pray for the end of the crisis. That will be the end of every problem, obviously. But it's allowed by God for a reason. Just like the bishop said, I don't, I don't think you would ever have seen a, uh, the great apostasy if, if this did not happen. Because if you had a pope teaching, okay, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, I mean, you would still have a lot of Catholics everywhere, obviously. Imagine today if we had a pope like just blasting, like uh, that would change a lot of things. Especially today, because in the uh, in in our days, uh, communication is is so fast. So there has never, I mean, Pope Pius XII had the radio and. I guess the communication was better, but you know it was uh, 200 years ago. But still, we never really had a, a pop in, in a situation like today, where co you know a pop just imagine a pop would just issue a document. The whole planet is taught right away. Okay, no, this is wrong because of that, right? You don't have to go through your Gallican bishop. <laughs> no, it's true. So it would be just amazing. I was thinking about that, but <laughs> I think that would be. <laughs> uh, I don't know. It seems to me uh, to be a little bit um, unfitting, but you could have a, like a you could have like a, a Vatican Twitter account, I suppose, who would relay certain decisions that he made, things like that. But I don't see the Pope being on Twitter. Like I know that's I'm first off, he does not even. I mean, s uh, most of the time he would actually use secretaries and, and whatnot anyway for any documents. So. Yeah. 
I mean, the, the corruption that we are in today would have never happened if we had a Pope. There's no doubt. Even not just the Catholics, but society as a rule. Um, but now, if we have a Pope now today, he's probably going to be put into jail in 30 minutes. I mean, <laughs> in the sense that imagine he comes out and he says, okay, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. Well, because we are kind of protected because we don't have much uh, visibility in the sense that, you know, people. We're not really denounced by Antifa or whatever, they don't care about us. But if, if you had a pop today, very publicly uh, defending the faith, and uh, well, they would, the modern world would be in a entering in a case of a, like a cri crisis, snowflake crisis, as we speak about at the refectory. <laughs> okay, we have already the words of uh, Pope Isaac XI at the bottom of the page. Jesus Christ sent his apostles into the whole world in order that they might permeate all nations with the gospel uh, faith, the faith of the gospel, and lest they should err, uh, he will beforehand that they should be taught by the Holy Ghost. Has then this doctrine of the apostles completely vanished away or sometimes been obscured in the church whose ruler and defense is God himself? If our Redeemer plainly said that his gospel was to continue not only during the times of the apostles, but also till future ages, is it possible that the object of faith should, in the process of time, become so obscure and uncertain that it would be necessary today to tolerate opinions which are even incompatible one with another? If this were true, we should have to confess that the coming of the Holy Ghost and the Apostles and the perpetual indwelling of the same Spirit in the Church, that's a very important point, the indwelling of the same Spirit in the Church, and the very preaching of Jesus Christ have several centuries ago lost all their efficacy and use to affirm which would be blasphemy. Uh, okay, here we have the quote of Leo the Thirteenth. So actually, it was from Leo the Thirteenth. He says, "The Church, founded on these principles and mindful of her office, has done nothing with greater zeal and endeavor than she has displayed in guarding the integrity of the faith. Hence, she regarded as rebels." Uh, rebels, rather, right? and expelled from the ranks of her children all who held beliefs on any point of doctrine different from her own. So, <laughs> expelled from the ranks of her children. So, uh, again, uh, I don't know if you saw that, but yesterday Bergoglio said that even blasphemers, apostate, whatever, they are still, they are still our brothers. They are still in the communion of saints. That's what he said. So. The Holy Father. <laughs> so obviously, he doesn't believe anything. <laughs> okay, and just so you really know that quote, I have put it again, the one of the uh, Deiphidius. For even as God wills all men to be saved and to arrive at the knowledge of the truth, even as Christ came to save what had perished, and to gather together the children of God who had been dispersed. So the church, constituted by God, the mother and teacher of nations, knows its own office as debtor to all, and is ever ready and watchful to raise the fallen, to support those who are falling, to embrace those who return, to confirm the good and to carry them on to better things. Hence, it can never forbear uh, from witnessing to and proclaiming the truth of God, which heals all things, knowing the, the words addressed to it. My spirit that is in thee, and my words that I pu have put in thy mouth, shall not depart out of thy mouth from henceforth and forever. Again, the idea of, like, it can never be taken away. Okay. Questions on that or, or not? But yes, we are in a very terrible situation, if that's what you are thinking, obviously. To not have the infallible voice of the church. Uh, we have to pray for the end of the crisis. Good? Yes?
Well, uh, it depends in the sense that if instead of those two dogmatic constitutions you only had disciplinary decrees, then it would just be disciplinary, right? So it depends really what it contains. But in this case, it definitely it's about dogma. But you could, you could in theory, and I think they actually the in the list of, of uh, councils, I think there was a, a one or two that were like that, where they only treated discipline. Okay, we are tired of priests doing this, basically, and now you have to do this and that and this. And that was all the council did, and that's fine. Like it, it could do that. You know what I mean? So uh, it, let me see if I—I uh, I don't know where I put that list, but I think one of the um, the Lateran, some of the Lateran councils were like that, where they were pretty much completely disciplinary. Uh, that is possible. So. But in the case of Vatican II, you know, we. Uh, we have actually dogmatic constitution, literally. Lumen Gentium is actually called a dogmatic constitution. You also have a pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world, which is Gaudium et Spes. But you have a dogmatic constitution on the church defining her nature. That's Lumen Gentium. Yes, uh, Nico? Uh, the uh, yes, as far as the authentic magisterium, um, but however, the mission of a church continues, and we do that every day uh, to teach, to rule, and to sanctify. It's just that we don't do it with authority. But it's still part of the mission. What I mean by this is, as a priest today, you are not just giving the sacraments; you also have a duty to continue the mission of a church by teaching the faith, because that is actually necessary for their salvation, obviously, and also uh, to actually make sure they are ready to receive the sacraments. So it's all part of the mission of the church. So magisterium is still, it depends how you mean it, like, in, uh, like of authentic, okay, but as far as teaching, it, it does continue and has to continue. It's part of the mission of the church. It cannot stop, okay? But we're just repeating basically what was said before already and teaching the faith. Yes? Well, it's always conditionally to the will of God because it's really a temporal thing. In the sense that what we what we have to pray in an absolute manner is whatever is necessary for our salvation. And the crisis today is definitely an occasion for many to to lose their soul. But in itself, you could still save yourself, even in this crisis. Obviously, there are a lot of people who die, and you know they can still go to heaven. But so we we do pray conditionally. Also, we know that I mean it had to happen. Uh, it was foretold that the great apostasy would happen and all this, so in a way, it's uh, like it, it had to happen, but think about the words of our Lord that when he said that for the sake of the elect there would be, uh, the those, those days would be shortened, we can pray that it be shortened as much as possible because in the meantime, obviously, a lot of people lose their soul because they just follow what Bergoglio says and then, you know, they lose, lose the faith. So it's always conditionally, obviously, to, to the will of God, ultimately, but... Um, but we have actually uh, a duty to pray for that because it's uh, it's, it's objectively it's it's a very uh, grave um, uh, occasion of of, of um, uh, yeah losing their souls for people for a lot of people. So, but as the, the bishop preached on Sunday on that, God allows things like that sometimes for a greater good. And it does not necessarily seem obvious to us, but. We just have to uh, to bear it in the light of faith. God knows what He does. So. But we should still pray for it, though. <coughs> like uh, the great the um, the great Western season was a very, I mean, it was way better than we are today. But uh, it was still a terrible situation when you had the, the three pops, quote unquote. And you, I forgot which. Uh, but you had a few saints, obviously, who, who prayed a lot, but particularly there was a mystic who uh, offered basically herself as a victim f to end the, the season, and somehow her body was divided in three parts. I'm not exactly sure how it, that worked, but obviously, I mean, she was still one body, obviously, but the, there was the connection between three parts of the body were, were, was not functioning properly, 
and that was uh, given by God as obviously a very ter terrible suffering to uh, to uh, to pay as a victim for the end of the great Western season where the church was basically divided in three parts, so to speak. Okay, so <laughs> you see today if you offer yourself as a victim, whatever, the matter and form will be separated. So you. <laughs> <laughs> No, but uh, what is true, I mean, I'm saying that as a joke, but what is true, though, is that this is very, this is very uh, serious, and we should definitely, I mean, as a priest, you always have to keep, anyway, the, the spirituality of offering yourself as a victim for souls, but particularly in, in this day and age, and I would say we, under that aspect of uh, asking God to, to end this crisis. But do we have to go through the Antichrist first? I don't know, you know, so. Don't ask me, I'm not a prophet. So pray conditionally, but just for the sake of souls, basically. For the sake of souls, for the sake of the glory of God. All right. More questions? Yes? Uh, yeah, it's in the Catechism of the Council of Trent, yes, absolutely. And also St. Paul speaks about it. Yeah. The Council of Trent, the, or what the Catechism, at least, the Catechism of the Council of Trent explicitly says, black and white, that before the end of the world, you need to have the faith preached everywhere, the great apostasy and the Antichrist. So the faith preached everywhere, uh, pretty much everybody agrees that that was done under Pope Pius the nine, uh, sorry, Pope Pius the 11th and Pope Pius the 12th. And our, because our Lord, he said in the gospel, he said the gospel will be preached in the whole world and then the end will come. So I don't know if he meant like right away, but it looks to us like, okay, <laughs> the gospel was preached everywhere the, with the last missionary efforts under Pope Pius the 12th. And then boom, like it pretty much happened right away. Uh, so now we're in the great apostasy. So I don't know, the third one is the Antichrist. I don't know if that comes right next or not, uh, but definitely it makes you think. <laughs> Without getting into uh, no, a lot of crazy conspiracy theories, uh, still just holding to the faith, it, it, uh, it's not unlikely at all. So we should be prepared for that. I remember Bishop Sandman uh, maybe two or three years ago for a speech of graduation at the school. He basically said something like that. He said, you know, you young people get ready. I mean, pretty much. He says, I'm, I'm dying, but you will be in trouble. Basically, that's what he said. And he's right in the sense that, uh, he, I mean, he might actually see it himself. I don't know, but we have a lot of you know, probability, let's say. So we should get ready. I don't know. We'd it's probably better, but we don't know. Many times, God doesn't tell us too much so that we don't. <laughs> so basically, we are able to sleep at night. <laughs> and we just uh, surrender to his providence. So. But uh, yeah, that's what it is. So. OK. Um, are we good to go now? <laughs> The secondary object of the infallible magisterium. So this is a very, very important page and everybody will be very happy here because those things obviously are very disputed in a sense. The teaching of the church and theologians is very clear, but it's contested by the recognize and resist uh, position in a very striking manner. So it's incredible when you read what they write, you're like, how, you know, how is it possible that they would write that? It's, it's almost like word for word condemned. <laughs> so. So let's look at that. The previous chapter has underlined the spiritual beauty and purity of the church in her faithfully preserving and explaining the deposit of revelation by the definition of immediately revealed truths, which are the primary object of her infallible magisterium. And again, Our Lady in the Gospel was the example of that, when it is said that she kept all of those words and she was meditating on them. It's exactly what the church does. But this spiritual beauty and purity could not be preserved unless the church were also able to exercise her infallible magisterium on that which is intimately connected to these revealed truths. This is called the secondary object of her infallible magisterium. So here I am quoting Cardinal Lepicier because he gives a good list. Uh, Cardinal Lepicier is a very good, uh, very good author, very good theologian. Uh, also, he has written. Uh, very edifying spiritual books. So I'm a big fan of Cardinal Lepicier. Father Fries also, he, he really loves Father Le uh, Cardinal Lepicier. He was of uh, the order of the uh, Servites of Our Lady. 
Uh, anyway, he says, first, whatever belongs to the general discipline of a church in the sense that the church cannot approve uh, a discipline obligatory for all the faithful, which would be contrary to faith or good morals, or which would greatly harm religion. All right, first one, discipline. I'm going to write them down here. Discipline. Uh, after that, secondly, the approbation of religious orders, in the sense that such a way of life is approved as conducive to perfection. Religious orders, well, we'll see that it means the, uh, it's a definition, it's not just an approval. So, for example, in, in dioceses, it was very common that you had thousands of congregations of religious sisters, and, but they were not an order like the Order of St. Dominic or something, they would be sisters of something. So the sisters of St. Thomas Aquinas are more akin to that. Thirdly, the canonization of saints. All right, canonization. Uh, in the sense that God could not allow that a damned man, enemy of Christ and servant of the devil, be proposed to the veneration and imitation of the faithful. Notice that, imitation. So it's actually contested now by our and our, I saw that the other day. Uh, they will say, oh yeah, 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 the canonization is only that somebody is in heaven, but it doesn't say he, was, he led the holy life. So like, what is the point of the process? And I mean, in the sense, <laughs> otherwise we just canonized all the babies, basically. You have the baby, he was baptized, yeah, okay, we have a new saint. That's not what the church does, obviously. It's, co it's, it's completely absurd. But anyway, they try anything. Uh, fourthly, the questions of convenience or detriment relat relative to the church, such as the moral necessity for the Roman pontiff to be politically independent or the relations between church and state uh, and so forth. All right, so more like, it's, I would put politics, but <laughs> in relation to the church, obviously. Uh, relations between church and state. Fifthly, the judgment uh, of doctrines and discoveries of human sciences or of human laws and institutions in the sense that the church could pronounce on their truth and honesty based on revealed principles. So that covers philosophy, philosophical truths, but also science uh, in the sense that obviously if, if a scientist says, oh, the world is eternal, then the church will be like, boom, condemned, because it's in the sacred scripture that it's not. Well, actually, that would not, I mean, that would not be secondary object, it would be directly the first object, but maybe things that are a little more remote, that implicitly will deny a, a, f a truth of faith, then the church can intervene in that. Sixthly, dogmatic facts. So dogmatic facts are facts, historical facts, uh, that are, have a link with dogma, also, we'll explain all of us. Uh, we shall analyze these uh, each at a time. So here you have the reference in the the Ecclesia of Lepicier. We don't have it here, but if you want to uh, to have a look at it, ask Father Fleece, he has it. Cardinal Lepicier wrote uh, a big series of uh, theology, and he has even wrote on, on subjects that are not uh, treated by many. For example, he has uh, a tract on St. Joseph, which is very good, actually. So a little bit like you do Mariology with uh, Merkel back here where you, know, you study Our Lady very um, deeply in every aspect, he does the same for St. Joseph. So we, we cannot do that in the seminary, but I really invite you to have a look afterwards or during vacation or something. It's very interesting, obviously. Um, all right, theological conclusions and philosophical truths. The very preservation of a deposit of, of revelation demands that the church also judge doc doctrines which, although not immediately revealed by God, are nonetheless related to the deposit of revelation. These are theological conclusions or mere philosophical truths whose negations would logically lead to denied uh, revealed truths. Truth, sorry. These truths belong to the secondary object of infallibility. Uh, that is to say that the church in defining truths of this kind or in condemning contrary errors is also infallible. Uh, according to Salaveri, well, I guess we'll continue that later on, but, uh, yeah, because we'll get into something a little more complicated. So let's st stop here and we'll resume here tomorrow. <laughs>